I did a fine art course in Nottingham after a pre-diploma course, and the idea of doing sculpture was, to my mind, about being sort of really physically involved and getting dirty and using plaster and clay and all this sort of thing. But the time I went, it was sort of filled with people on typewriters doing very minimal work, and the atmosphere was a little bit sort of constraining to do more sort of figurative and explorative, just playful ideas and I started using small bits of driftwood and not taking myself seriously and just sort of playing about really just enjoying uh, the forms and I found that wood seemed to work very well with me the sort of shapes that came from from driftwood it's always like trying to find a way of making sort of sculpture or making whatever doesn't really matter what it's called but that um, that fits your own character and you feel uh, happy with and also fits into what you perceive as a sort of niche within society. I made this uh, chess set which was a uh, very ambitious and complicated thing and I spent days and days just trying to figure out the, what the angles were and it was but that was nice and that was made with um, railway sleepers. I made the the seats eventually with some pitch pine from Glasgow Tenements. So there was all this timber and I was trucking it down till the authorities reckoned I was affecting the structure of the Macintosh building and had to stop. So it was sort of demolition timber was the, was the next. And so it's, again, it's a, a feeling of having a sort of freedom, a free access to, to a material that you didn't have to be, you know, very precious with it, which was, you know, very exhilarating. Tim doesn't uh, begin with a finished design in his mind. Um, and then he makes the wood fit that idea he's got. It's a much more uh, natural process for him. And it's a much more inventive process. So he'll look at a piece of wood and that'll give him ideas. He's got ideas. It's not that he's not very thoughtful. Uh, he is very thoughtful. He's very thoughtful about the sort of... Uh, basically what he's trying to discover, which is something that really excites him, he thinks is really beautiful, that really expresses something he wants to say. But he doesn't know what that is before he's discovered it, and he discovers it again and again each time. And so it's always new, but it's always fresh. So he's not repeating things, he's rediscovering things. And the uh, so it's, it's, it's the marriage of his intellect and thought with the material and with his feelings uh, and they they have to come you know they have to come together as one you know so it's uh, I mean that's why they're so that's why they're so good when I was director of the museums and galleries in Glasgow the gallery of modern art was a particular project that I developed and there was a little place uh, which when we were working on the building, we discovered, we didn't know it existed there, that this little sort of cavity in the heart of the building, which, which had a hole through which you could look down to another space. And I immediately thought the only person who really, I think, can really make that work is Tim. Talking with Julian Spaulding, the idea evolved into being, you know, much more of a, of a room to do the whole space where you went into it. So it became this... Uh, it was called the, a womb with a view. It was so again, very nice sort of to have to do a small space that people could walk inside and get a different atmosphere from being sort of inside to out. We wanted some seating downstairs. There's these big pillars of stone, and I, I rather like the idea of having sort of seats of of like a tree, you know, so that which you sat on, which were truncated. So he made those as well. Chairs are the most difficult things to design because they have so much function needs to happen. They need to be the right height off the ground. They need to be uh, comfortable and they have to work. So it's um, a much more constraining but a more sort of fascinating project to come up with like a new design for a chair. 
and um, they've all evolved over a different time. And you keep on, I keep on trying to, you know, think, well, design a new chair. But it just is something which doesn't sort of come very easily. So over the years, we've done, you know, quite a few different chairs. I remember you coming home from Edinburgh one day and saying, you're absolutely really came bursting through the door and you said, I have just seen the chair I want to sit in for the rest of my life. You're going to have to come and look at this. <laughs> and I thought, it must be some chair. <laughs> well, here I am sitting in it. Yeah, yeah. Damn fine chair. Yeah. When I see it as a sort of timeless, neo-primitive chair, which um, it, it, it doesn't seem to me to pay lip service to any fashions in any art movements or anything. And uh, so far as I'm concerned, it, it was a very impressive piece of sculpture that I could sit in. But I decided it would be nice to have a chair with only one arm, uh, because it is very nice to have an arm on your chair, at least one of them. And, and I tend to sort of sit a bit sloppy, and you know, especially when there's people all around the table. Um, and so I asked him to make me a one-armed chair, which is great, because without moving your chair at all, you can get things out of the oven and stand up and go and fetch things and then snuggle down into it again. So I call it a one-armed slave chair. <laughs> and I love it dearly. I think really all the other pieces just sort of came along the way, didn't they? Well, having got two chairs, then we needed a table and it sort of grew like that. It does speak for itself and, and uh, it is, it's just a part of a tree that's been reshaped and reconstructed by Tim and it's been opened up to show all its secrets and reveal its, its messages and its history and um, it's just thoroughly satisfactory really. <laughs> I didn't think perhaps that we would have a piece of his sculpture, but somehow one of them sang to us and there it was. <laughs> I think it's really wonderful. A tree is a thousand horrible tests. A tree is a year's worth of pencils. A tree is a home to the birds. A tree is our clear, fresh air. A tree is a greengrocer's store. A tree is a plank. A tree is a high red fence. A tree is wonderful. There's been a sort of rot that's come into there. So I feel that there's a way that I like to put uh, sculpture across. And it's really, a lot of it is just sort of sharing the, the pleasure of structure with, with wood. And I think the best opportunity I've had for that is to do this recent project with Chatelroux Primary School. They asked me to produce a sculpture for a playground. I said yes, but I was very unsure because of the feeling of how the children would particularly in appreciate that. So it became this whole idea of a, of a kit, really. So it never became you know, a static uh, piece of sculpture. It was always like a surprise, so they're really caught up now in the in the making of things. It was just really just fascinating because you'd never think that anything as boring as trees would become so interesting. That you could make actual like stuff that looks really good. I thought it would just have been uh, basic. I never knew it could be something so special, uh, interesting. If you take a, like a tree or something like that and just cut it in half, there's so many different patterns inside and it's just wonderful and um, it's just natural and you've just got this warm feel about it as well. They're so open. I mean, I've done, you know, I'm very pleased with what I've done, but what the, the sort of layers of imagination that they're going to put onto it is just going to be incredible. You'd never think that anything as boring as trees would become so interesting. Looks really good. I got a phone call from uh, from an architect. Who would I be interested to put forward a design for uh, a chair for a chapel? And uh, I think it's one of the best. It is probably the best opportunity I've had to do work on that scale and um, in that in that context. And that was that was really. Such a such an enjoyable job to do. And the first chair I did was I was really really pleased with. 
I'd brought it into the house and it just looked really good. One thought that was coming up was, well, perhaps we should have something which says this is in memoriam. And I hate these little brass plaques that go on, so I thought I could incorporate that. And so we changed it to, we had We Remember in the back, so it's the start of, they went from uh, We Remember, so Walnut, Elm, Rowan, Elm, Maple, Elm, Maple, Beech, Elm, Rowan, and then a piece of U in the, in the bottom. The, the idea of the chapel had, had come up uh, a number of years before, and the idea of having a commemorative chapel for the North Sea oil industry in Aberdeen uh, for celebrate 25 years of North Sea exploration. But the tragedy of the Piper Alpha assumed, you know, another significance. But it is very much uh, a chapel that has um, many functions and it can be closed off simply with the paddles sort of rotating and so as a much more private space for weddings and christenings and uh, it's a very nice chapel. Cafe Gandolfi was, was great fun. Um, Ian McKenzie was the photographic technician at the Glasgow School of Art, and he had this completely madcap idea of having a, a cafe in Glasgow. And uh, he said, you know, would you like to do the thing? I said, yeah, absolutely, go for it. And uh, there wasn't really a, much of a budget, and we just did it. things which it was, it was so brilliant to do. Nowadays, you know, everything is so much more organised with uh, spreadsheets and business plans and all sorts of, of tea leaf reading nonsense that uh, accountants and things insist on. Whereas we just went for it. And according to modern principles, it just shouldn't have worked. It was in the wrong part of Glasgow. You know, there wasn't the sort of experience to run it, and yet it's been such a, an amazing success. And the people, you know, so many people in Glasgow feel it's their cafe and it, they bring people to it. It's wonderful. But that gave me a great opportunity to do work which was of a sort of scale and, and an interest which was beyond the domestic. With a cafe, you know, you can just go mad, really. And that's, that's what we did. The commission for the Pope's chair, when he uh, did his visit to Scotland, this was particularly for the Murrayfield children's celebration of his visit. And I got a visit from uh, our priest, Dick Luca. He had been sent round to find a seat when we were preparing for the, the papal visit, the first major venues was the, the youth event in Murrayfield. And Murrayfield being such a huge stadium, uh, big area, we needed something, you know, we needed something impressive and big. And basically I said, I need something that is distinctively Scottish, and I would prefer if it was made of Scottish woods. And I said, I want something that talks about uh, the Gospels. The angel of Matthew, the lion of Mark, the bull of Luke, the eagle of John's Gospel. And then he just built it straight out of oak. It's mainly oak. There's some ash and elm and a few other woods. That, well, frankly, I don't know what they are, but you know, they're, they're all there. But I think it's quite an impressive piece of furniture. And, uh, it's a very, I feel it's a very Scottish piece of furniture. I really appreciate his work on it. No, it felt really, really good when, uh, you know, to see it on television, in spite of the fact that it was credited to Brianstead, but that's my father, so that's all right. <laughs> Timstead's chess piece, I think, is a, a wonderful piece of furniture, sculpture, 
which actually sums up the, the two halves or perhaps just two parts of Tim Stead, which is the, the furniture maker and the sculptor. We see here very much an approach to Tim Stead's work, which is not driven by a furniture making or cabinet making tradition. It's very much driven by the material, by the form in the material, and by the, I suppose, his love of sculpture, of forms other than furniture. I mean, when you talk to Tim, it's not the history of furniture that has inspired him. It's actually architecture, it's the environment, it's the, the use of found materials in all other forms of applied arts and crafts. And I think that's why the chess piece is, is a wonderful piece to sum up the character of Tim Stead. I think I've always enjoyed the, uh, you know, this making of a different sort of family of forms and the way of bringing in some of the experiments that I'm doing uh, with sculpture, the sort of forms that I like, sort of like the towers which are cut from uh, sort of one block and that they uh, come out in a sort of telescope and then the sort of various horn forms um, and so that each piece is, is different. It's again, it's about, you know, not being regulatory, something which uh, you get a pleasure from sort of touching and looking at. We have at present from Tim um, a table in the entranceway to the tower of the New Museum of Scotland, which is a wonderful piece and it's, it's great to actually stand at the entrance to the museum and see people come in and the first thing they do is touch it and the last thing they do before they leave the museum is touch the table. He's of his time, he's a person who's discovered new things and set a whole lot of new generation going in. A, he's opened doors to people that uh, will enable people to do all sorts of different things in the wood school and the community wood program. All this has naturally grown out of his life and his inspiration. The whole involvement with, um, with woodland started about 12 years ago. But I felt that there was, it was important to replant. I felt, you know, just sort of really a sort of politeness that you keep on, you know, you go to somebody's house and you just keep eating and eating. You feel you should, you know, do something in, in return. And that was a feeling that I felt there needed to be a balance for just personally that I would plant some trees. This idea of community woodland was, was in the air. And so it was, you know, how to divine a community woodland. And extraordinarily enough, in about, I think, two months after the meeting that we had in the village hall, um, somebody from that meeting said, we're doing a survey for a farm nearby who's wanting to sell off a parcel of woodland and open ground planting. Are you interested? Wow. But it was like £32,000, which we managed to raise in about six weeks. And it's now sort of evolved into, you know, a very, very good, you know, community-run woodland. The wood school came came out of um, an idea to try to do to do something about this because we're planting a lot of trees, and so it's, you know, what is going to happen in the sort of long-term sustainability. You've really got to sort of work on developing you know, a more sort of woodland culture, which is about the making as well. So to have, um, you know, you need to have access to machines and a lot of young designers don't have that. So we now have a number of spaces where, you know, people who are almost ready to sort of have a go at setting up on their own can uh, take on bench space and work together and have joint marketing and try and sort of solve some of the problems and use the local timber. A lot of approaches that other people make to, to the material uh, is imposing uh, and dictating a lot more to the material. It's rare that you're getting a board which has got this interesting, the outside edge of the tree. It's only when you saw it yourself, most sawmills will cut this off to save everybody the time to get it to this nice rectilinear form. So again, as soon as you think, oh, no, I can't cut that off, then you're left with the problem, okay, well, if you can't cut it off, what are you going to do with it? It's 
so there's a continual sort of challenge to uh, sort of come up with with an idea to get you around the problem of you know, a piece of wood which is uh, doesn't fit into the previous scheme of things and uh, it's really to try and work in, in harmony with that, that material and try and get, maintain those sort of inherent qualities that there are in the wood. This is something which I always wanted, a house which I could sort of develop and really make it my own. I would hate to sort of live in a sort of very clinical, mass-produced environment. Most pieces of work in the house have a, have a story and a, a history. You're always looking around for different forms of uh, influence, and it's particularly things that you look at perhaps in detail and marvel at, I mean, like the construction of a, of a bird's skull or... Um, I have a beautiful piece of uh, baleen, which is the sort of uh, part of the whale it's gills. You can never do anything as beautiful as that, but there's something inherently within that sort of construction which is just so wonderful, and you just want to uh, enjoy it really with your with your hands as as well as your eyes. All art is praise, John Ruskin said that, the 19th century writer said all art is praise. And Tim is in praise of, of wood, obviously, but he's in praise of, uh, of you know, your individual stance or your individual culture, the culture that grows out of your own environment, your own roots, your own relationship with the world. So it's, uh, it's, he's making a very rich, uh, original statement for our times. Through the work, often I'm introducing people to wood in a very different, different way. So I mean, I, I sort of love it, and um, that's often the the feeling that other people get at seeing the work of, you know, this is wood used in a in a different way, and it's it's accessible and it's warm to touch, and it's a great pleasure. <laughs>